Hello, everybody, and welcome to Sacred Spaces. My name is Jennifer Dixon. And I am Merritt Malik Plum. And today we will be summarizing the yamas and the niyamas, right? We, we have, have yes, we have been on a journey with these. Oh my gosh. And yes. when we started the journey, the quarantine and the the epidemic wasn't where it is now. And so we've had a lot of shifts in perspective and oh, a lot of awakenings. <laughs> to say it the least. It all looks very different now than it did when we started. Very true. It's, it's an interesting yeah. thing that I believe that there are no coincidences, right? And I, I find it interesting that we decided to take this path and, and talk about the Yamas and then get into the niyamas right when all of these things started unfolding. We didn't have any idea it was going to happen, and yet it happened, and we were studying these tools that could potentially help us while we manage the stress and the grief and the anxiety associated with this COVID-19 crisis. Right, and with so many people practicing yoga more at home, this is really a great journey to help you enter your practice with a full heart and full awareness. It's the first two limbs of an eight limb path of yoga. We've talked about that quite a bit. Ashtanga if you haven't watched yoga. our videos, please watch them because we go into each one and talk about it and explore it and share kind of our experience with it. And they're also being published as podcasts on all the major podcast yes. platforms. Yeah. So you can check us out at Thrive Yoga and Wellness on the podcast. The podcast name is Thrive Yoga and Wellness. And then this vlog is being posted as well on YouTube at the youtube.com forward slash C forward slash Thrive Yoga and Wellness. That's a, yes. a big mouthful. So you can catch up with us there. And one of the things that I think we learned as we went along the journey is these are called the ethical guidelines of yoga. Some people call them the 10 commandments of yoga, but we kind of talked about, and I think both of us shifted our perspective as opposed to seeing these as mandates, seeing them more as an invitation to align with harmony with all of these. And the more that we grow in our consciousness and in our practice, the more these things just kind of naturally occur. Yes. And the yeah. other thing that I thought was beautiful, these 10 commandments, if you will, these uh, first two limbs, they are before the asana practice. Yeah. Right. They're before right. the physical postures, which is typically, at least here in the West, how we are introduced to yoga. Yes, yes, yes. In the West, yoga is more of a physical practice. So we're trying to bring in the holistic approach to yoga. And doing it in such a way that it does not have to be a threat to one's personal beliefs. Absolutely. Okay. These, these, these practices can be applied. They're really in any, any practice or any kind of spirituality. Um, and they really allow our consciousness to expand regardless of what we're applying them to, be it Christianity, Buddhism, you know, a spiritual practice of any kind that can enhance that if you're open to that. Mm -hmm. It's very powerful work. So let's talk a little bit about the yamas. So the you Yamas, a brief overview. Yep. We're not going to go into detail yeah. about all of them, although we could, and we would be here for like two hours at the very, very right, least. Right. We're going to revisit these in a few months or a year. Yeah. Yeah. I think that this would be kind of a fun thing to do as we explore all eight limbs. Cause we'll, we'll go into the third limb next week, but I guess we will. We haven't really talked about that. <laughs> I'm trying to remember how we explain the yamas. Um, These are the things that we want to limit. Yes, yes. There's there's five of them, and the first right. one is ahimsa, ahimsa. non-violence. 
nonviolence, nonviolence. And, yeah. and how that doesn't just mean nonviolence towards others, but it's also nonviolence toward yourself. Right. It gives us a opportunity to work on relinquishing hostility and irritability and any, any kind of um, harmful thoughts towards ourselves or others. Which is especially potent right now when we're right. stuck at home and dealing with the anxieties and the unknowns, practice nonviolence towards yourself because nobody knows anything right now. So I thought that was really fitting for right now. This one really allowed me to allow peace in my life in other areas that maybe I didn't think about. Oh, and I heard something else that I like kind of backing up a little about how we grow with the yamas and niyamas. I can't remember what I was reading. I'll have to go back and look that up so we can, um, so we can link it. But the, uh, the process of growing on this journey with the yamas and niyamas is kind of like when a baby is developing. So everything develops simultaneously. Like you're not getting your nose one day and your ears another day. Everything is evolving simultaneously. And as we grow with each one, you know, the growth expands. And does that make sense? It does. The entire okay. unit grows together. Instead of, yes. instead of like Legos, you build it one Lego at a time. It is, mm -hmm. it is an entire it grows in entirety. So I think that's beautiful. Yeah, There's you're right. Big old black cat outside. <laughs> Never Squirrel. seen him before. Squirrel. So the next one is truthfulness or satya. Yes. And what did that mean to you, especially in light of the events of 2020? It reminds me a lot of the four agreements um, always speak your truth. For me, it was a lot about aligning with the core of my individuality and truth and really allowing others to do that too. Yep. Yep. That was and exactly honoring, what I was going to say. Honoring those truths. And really with this whole thing that's been going on with the pandemic, I think you and I have talked about this. Everyone is, especially since the whole reopening stuff started, Everybody is so vastly different in how they need to move through this. Mm -hmm. And I've really moved to a soft space with that because I feel guilty. Like people who are ready to start coming back for sessions. Um, my husband works for TVA and they have their own rules and laws that we're needing to follow because his job's very important to us. And, you know, it, it I could really move into a place of guilt for not allowing people who are ready to come. And it's going to be a couple more weeks for me at least. And so I've had to just kind of reflect on that a lot. I think you and I talked really late about it one night and move from that place. Even when yeah. my truth is different from others, even when my truth is different from the mandates, Yep. Because I could get really angry and violent. Yep. I wouldn't be practicing nonviolence if, yep. if I wasn't being very meditative and reflective on this. Beautiful. I couldn't have said that any you? different. No, I couldn't have said it any differently. Yeah. No, I totally agree. And the, the point of truthfulness is honoring your own truthfulness, but then being okay with a different truth. Right. And also humility and integrity as we, as we work with our truth. Yep. And practicing ahimsa towards those with nonviolence towards those with a different truth. Exactly. And I think that that's, I think that that's been demonstrated more and more throughout this crisis in myself being like, all right, I don't, I don't necessarily have the same identification with this event as you, but you know what, that's okay. And I honor and respect that. And I think that's beautiful. You know, not, not like you and me in particular, but just in right. general with society. 
but I think you and I are a good example yeah. of it because we have had some differing opinions, but we've always respected each other. Yep. Yeah. And been able to talk about it without like blowing up. What? What's that? What do you mean? No. Yeah. But, that, but I think that that's beautiful and there's been no better time to practice this. Exactly. Um, so, and so, Satya, not Satya, excuse me, truthfulness than, than right now. It was Satya. Okay. So now the next one is non-stealing a stay yeah. Yes. Don't steal. Don't take anything that's not freely offered. And then when something is offered, only take what you need. The other one was the not stealing someone's peace, remember? And, or, you know, not, not, we talked about this because there's been a lot of stress with this entire pandemic, right? And everybody's dealing with it. And one thing that the book that we followed a lot, The Yamas and the Yamas by mm -hmm. Deborah Adele, Deborah we'll put a Adele. link down below. Great book. She, she talked about how you know, when someone's listening, talking to you about their grief or their stress, how it's so common that we're like, oh yeah, when my grandfather passed away, blah, 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 to try to identify it versus let the person get down into processing the emotions and not stealing their emotions by sharing yours. And, and that's been really big. And it builds on with the Satya, the truth and the nonviolence is letting people express their emotions and how they manage that. Right. All of these really interweave with each other. Agreed. Agreed and we 100%. were also talking about, and I really like the point we made about stealing other people's energy. Yep. And, you know, like being an energy vampire. And what are you doing? I'm moving rooms because oh, we have, okay. uh, we have stuff going on okay. and I'm trying to figure out the best place for me to go. You're going to laugh right. in order to, nobody to do this. Can, nobody can tell where you are. Just get comfortable. <laughs> Here well, we go. And, and, you know, back to what we were talking about, I know you and I are both in, you know, small businesses. We're kind of the sole proprietor and, you know, it, stealing someone's time. Like not yes. respecting someone's time. I have that happen a lot. Like people just assume I sit here all day and whenever they get ready that they can. And so I've really had to set my limits with that and say, I'm available between this time and this time and, you know, make it appointment based so that, you know, well, and, and that's beautiful too, because I have a tendency to both do that. Just be like, Oh, I see you. I'm going to talk your ear off. Oh, me too. And then also, but make, hmm, what's the word I'm trying to say? Not allow that to happen to me. That would be a better, I, I have, I struggle with that. It's a real struggle. It also, a stay also helped me kind of focus on what I consume. Huh? Really? Um, yeah, to make sure that I'm not stealing from my body nutritionally. That was an insight that came to me when I was, and I, I didn't consciously do it, but I realized when I was meditating on these this morning that that was something that kind of naturally happened. So that kind of, kind of takes me back to what I was saying about how when you, when you just bring your awareness to these, they, you know, our consciousness expands and they, uh, they enrich our lives in ways that we may not even be aware of until later. That's and the next one is Brahmacharya. Brahmacharya. But before we do, that's interesting oh. that you notice that because that's always been what my teacher has said. He's like, I don't tell people what to eat. I don't tell people how to live. That's right the more that they practice, the more this unwinds and unravels for them. And it, you just said it perfectly, what he's mm -hmm. always taught. So I thought that was really cool. Thank nice. you. Thank you, Manju. For oh, I'm awesome. very honored that I said something similar to Manju. Isn't that awesome? He's like, it's speaking the truth and you, it, and it totally aligned and flowed. It's just ancient wisdom that as we grow in our consciousness, it just kind of evolves and expands. Agreed. Beautiful. Totally agree. 
I think so too. So the next one, brahmacharya, non-excess. Energy moderation. They I like talk that. about They talk about celibacy with this, but that's kind of, that's kind of a broad. I think that you know. was meant more for the individuals, like the monks, like we have, we have, we have Catholic priests, you know, so if you're de dedicating your life to something like a priest does, then I see it. But as a householder, no, there's no way to, <laughs> to, to maintain a healthy house with that, but you can practice brahmacharya non-excess. Yeah, non-excess, in... non-excess. And, um, it literally means walking the way of God. Oh, beautiful. So again, you're, you know, anything that you're addicted to or that you're obsessive compulsive about, you're looking at that from a place of awareness and trying to move to a place of moderation. Beautiful. I mean, my grandfather used to always tell me moderation in all things, moderation in all things. Cause he had a glass of wine every night and you know, a lot of my friends where I grew up, that was like, Oh, not good. And you know, I, I remember talking to him about it and he said moderation and all things. And he lived his life that way. He lived to be 101. You know, I think that's beautiful. And I'm about to sneeze. This okay. is an area that I definitely struggle. I and this brings to violence to too when people yep. are, you know, this is leads into nonviolence too, because if you're addicted to things or you're doing things, you know, in excess, it can lead to violence to yourself. Yep. Nope. Or yeah, the it as you crave it, the things that you do to to satiate it. Yeah. No, I, I love that. I love that. Okay, so for the last one, a paragraha, non-possessiveness. Yes. This is a really powerful one for me because it's about allowing all things to be fluid and allowing others just to be who they are. And my daughter was my is my greatest teacher in this because I had all these ideas about how her life should be and you know when she started coming up with her own ideas they were completely different and so she's been a master teacher for me in this oh yeah nope I can see that my children are much younger but I can see how this is going to be a parental struggle of my own yes and when they're young like that you can kind of shape them and tell them what to do but there comes a time when they're like uh oh they get to make their own decisions and they may be vastly different than how you believe, but it is a opportunity to grow in your, in your love and in, a, in this non-possessiveness. No, I agree. I totally agree. It's a, it's an opportunity to experience letting go. And just like this crisis, the COVID crisis and the first few weeks, when the studio was shut down and I was trying to maintain the norm that was before the shutdown, I was possessing that idea of what is normal. It was killing me, you know, quite literally going nonstop. And then I was able to come into this paragraha, this letting go, this non-possessiveness. And it, and it was a beautiful fluid movement. We were ready to go online, but I had to kind of let go of some of those controlling things and have other people help me and things like that. And it ended up being a very, very, very fluid transition. And I'm very thankful for it. And I think that it prepared me for the tornado that happened because there's not a darn thing I can do about the tornado. Oh, not... man, I hadn't thought about it like that. And so wow. beca because I had already been like, whatever will be, I can't do anything. I can't make this. I'll continue to provide the, the service the best that I can. And, and now we're sitting here dealing with waiting for the contractors to finish working. And of course it's never as fast as I want it to be and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, well, it'll happen when it happens. And 
will open back up when we can open back up and hopefully when that time comes everybody will be ready and it'll it'll have a wonderful new facelift and that's a beautiful non-possessiveness inside i haven't thought about it in that context i like that I've had to reflect on this quite a bit. <laughs> this is the school of hard knocks of Pargra. <laughs> Listen, we are all working on many things. This has all just, it, the whole world has changed. Yeah. And it, we're it all having to really get in touch. The ones that are getting in touch are coming out, I think, a little less stressed, although there's stress getting there. But that's part that, of the journey. That's yeah. part of the journey. When, so. when I let go, when I let go and just was like, let's, we'll see what happens. And then suddenly I was able to sleep a little better and, you know, things just started working better and <sighs> that's good. It was good. So now let's, that was all five of the yamas, yes. the things that we might want to, hmm, I don't want to say mm -hmm. mitigate, but maybe tone down a bit, not, not practice. And the niyamas are the things that we want to cultivate, the things that we Expand, want to build. Right, on. right. And the first one is satcha, purity. Satcha, purity. I, what, did, what did this make you think of? Well, you know, a lot of people think hygiene and cleanliness, um, but I think it's purity of spirit for me. And, and thought it, for me. And thought, yes. Mind, body, and spirit. And, you know, yeah, it's just, for me, it has been simplifying and, and, and cleaning. And, and I've done a little bit of purging. I have a lot more I need to do. And that's been kind of how I've been practicing purity. And also simplifying my physical practice to more like, stretching and listening to my body from a more simple place than trying to have something on that's been really powerful for me oh, i don't beautiful. know if that's in alignment with purity but it feels very pure when i do it and i think about salcha when i do it I how about it. you for me again it goes this this pandemic and then the tornado did great great things because these negative thoughts, which is not practicing ahimsa towards myself, you know, the, I had to start practicing the non-possessiveness, letting go and not letting those bad thoughts come in, controlling the thoughts, thinking pure thoughts, like things are going to be okay. Things are going to be, I have no idea how, but they'll be okay. And so for me, it was a thought thing, like purifying the thoughts that came in, not letting the negative thoughts, the, the yeah. harmful things come in or the, not, the, the, the anxiety harboring on it. So that's kind of where, what this study at this point in time has meant for me. Right. And, you know, this, this pure part of us, to me, always reminds me of that eternal presence that we all are and the part of us that is undying and it's easier for me to stop striving for like physical perfection and just kind of rest in joyful awareness and i find when i can be in that place and i'm not suggesting i'm always able to stay there but when i'm able to come back to that everything just flows better so I think that's beautiful and I agree with you. Totally. And that moves us to Santosha, contentment. Contentment. Good lead oh, into that. That's a perfect lead into that. And this is a perfect time to be practicing contentment. You know, like so many people, it was really funny. I don't know if we talked about this. No, we, uh, we might have talked about it personally, but not during one of our episodes. Uh, midway through the shutdown, I had a buddy call who's single, never, never been married, doesn't have kids. And he called right at eight. So you can totally tell he's never had kids. You know, that's like the witching hour for people with young children. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's super sweet. He's a great guy. Love him to death. And he wanted to chat. And his thing was checking in on me because all of his other friends were going crazy, 
you know, stir crazy because they're stuck at home and they can't do this and they can't do that. And I kind of laughed and I said, well, life for me hasn't really changed that much in that regard because we have little kids. We don't go out. We still put our kids to bed while we try sometime between eight and nine, you know, that sort of thing. And I think that the pandemic and then the tornado and people were without power for over a week, you know, being so thankful that we had this E3, E4 four maybe tornado run right through our backyard and we had so few casualties we were so incredibly lucky and being content that even though we lost stuff like the studio lost stuff i know people that lost their entire homes most of their homes our lives were saved and the the grace that's found in that provided me with a lot of contentment like I'm so thankful for what I do have. And so that that's what Santosha has meant to me. For this right. And, and Santosha really is about accepting life as it is because we're always trying to create perfection. But in reality, all of this has proven to me that I have very little control. Very but if I am welcoming of things that come in that I perceive as hard as a opportunity to learn and grow instead of a punishment then I feel like I meet it more on its terms I see it more as neutral and I'm not letting it I'm not labeling it good or bad and then I feel more content because it doesn't feel like life's coming after me yeah and you're able to flow you're able to flow with it yep for sure all right so the next one tapas self-discipline yes uh, literally translates to fire, right? Or heat. 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 Yeah. And we talked about it a lot in the light of self-discipline. But, you know, it's about right effort. And, hmm. You I know, know I, I... Go ahead. Yeah. You go. And it's the, about I, effort and the internal fire to me. But not... It's still, it all, I love how these all build on each other. And just for me personally, in the last week to 10 days, I got a big, you know, smack in the face about tapas and self-discipline because I tend to be very disciplined when it comes to my exercise program. My exercise, my practice helps keep me from deal. That's how I manage the stress and anxiety. And I'm 40 this year. Yay. And I was overdoing it. I was totally overdoing it in my, in my endeavor to manage the anxiety that I felt I was doing too much, whether it be practicing, teaching or lifting weights. And so now like last week, I basically lost two and a half days because I couldn't move because my body said "Ah, no more. And I'm still a week into this and a couple of visits to an acupuncturist and a chiropractor. And I still, I'm, I'm not even going to touch a weight in my upper body because I overdid it. So there's that same balancing act and honoring both the yamas and the niyamas. You want to have the self-discipline. You want to take care of your body physically. You want to eat the right things. You want to study the right things, which goes to the next niyama, right? But you have to do it in a way that is not possessive to this ideal physique, maybe that you're looking for and nonviolent to your body. And, you know, maybe when I was 25 or even 35, I could have managed those levels of intensity and that much activity and load, but I'm 40 now and I wasn't sleeping. And so the recovery time is different. And so the last week has been a really great reminder about balancing that self-discipline with the nonviolence and listening and not being excessive. Cause I was being excessive. I was, I was not in, I was not in harmony with the yamas necessarily as I managed this, this current situation. Yes. And it goes back to moderation and finding mm-hmm. that sweet spot for you mm-hmm. in your practice. Yep. And, you know, we, when we did this one, we talked about the campfire and oh, you yeah. can apply all these concepts to a campfire mm-hmm. because if you put a lot of gas on it and you throw a lot of stuff on it and it doesn't get oxygen, you'll smother it out. But, you know, if you build it slowly 
and you know build upon build upon build on it then you can have a fire that you know will burn a wet log and you know but you have to stoke it and kindle it and when you do it'll burn away impurities and yeah. spark your spirit beautiful beautiful so what's next i'm cheating that, over here i've got it's another. okay it's self-study i alluded to it but i need to read because i'm afraid to to, to butcher the pronunciation svadhaya svadhaya <laughs> svadhaya yeah so we study. Talk, yeah self-study it's self-study and so we take all of our lessons and classes and workshops and things we learn in life and we take that into the internal self and discern and grow in our self-awareness mm -hmm. yep that's what and it means the, to me to me too and it's a the the thing that i want to emphasize is that self-study never ends no you, you know for those for those of you that might be watching and you're in high school when you graduate you're not done you're just beginning you know and when you finish right. your your college degree or your your postdoctorate you're you're just beginning life is a series of lessons and the sooner that we understand that we we never stop learning and we f roll with it or flow with it i believe the better off we'll be as humans and as an entire human race rather than just being like all right i finished school i'm done i'm going to do this and nothing more and right go ahead I know that's that's fine just continuing to study yourself to study the world around you to improve the whole point you don't as soon as you stop growing like like trees if they're not growing they're dying and yeah this has been really cool for me because some of the things that we have talked about in sacred spaces we did the chakras and the elements and all these things that I studied very deeply early in my career and I apply it to what I do still, but I haven't gone back into them and they look so different now. I study the yoga Patanjali, the yoga sutras by Patanjali, which all this is based off of. And, you know, I didn't go into the yamas and niyamas in depth like this, but they were all woven into that workshop I did and that study that I did gosh 25 years ago probably and this has just been to revisit it has been powerful for me because everything looks very different in your 20s <clears throat> than it does in your 50s oh that's true very different very true so yes we want to continue our self-study and allow that to bring us back to happiness and the divine because that is our nature beautiful self study leads in my mind leads to that i agree with that and now to finish up with the niyamas i love how you make me do all the hard pronunciation Ishvara, i was trying to do better today you've done really well you've I've done been really trying well. to say them today Ishvara, but uh, yeah, yeah, I can say our uh, is Isvara Pranidama. Yeah, I'll let you go with that. Yeah. What does that mean? Dedication to the highest, um, uh, surrender to the supreme, surrender, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, surrender to whatever your divine isness is. That that's absolutely the most perfect thing to finish the study with and to consider in light of the pandemic and even in light of the pandemic plus the tornado for us for the, for the viewers that are in the area with us that are dealing with it it's surrendering to the divine and if you're even if you're agnostic or atheist just surrendering to this is right. Life. You you can apply whatever you believe to these. If spiritual is spiritual or God isn't comfortable for you, the inner self, higher consciousness, whatever you practice, these can be applied. 
and surrendering to that which comes. And I, I believe that the purpose is we have these circumstances come up and we practice self-study. We, we do all these things. We have the self-study and the self-discipline self and we aren't possessive of these things and we practice our truthfulness and ahimsa. And if we all are going along this path, all of these things building, all 10 of these are building blocks, right? That with the, the basic tenet being nonviolence, imagine the world if all of us could practice these things regardless where you came from regardless your skin tone regardless your religious affiliation imagine imagine the world like the song the the john lennon wasn't it lennon that saying imagine and yes that was john lennon and the and for those of you that know me everybody knows that i'm a very spiritual and religious person so the beauty of it is even without that, imagine a world where we're all practicing nonviolence and truthfulness, or even if you start from this, the niyamas and we're practicing surrendering to that, which is that which is, and we learn how we are in what our place is in that which is with self-study and self-discipline and just imagine going down that tower. It's beautiful and, and what the world could be like. Right. Absolutely. And also when we practice and work on mastery and the yamas and the yamas along with our physical practice, the benefits are supreme. And I think that people start to notice I, I really do think that people start to notice just like when you first start your regular yoga practice. I remember when I first started yoga, I was always into fitnessy things, right? But I got into yoga, the power yoga and then Ashtanga and about six months into it, I hadn't lost any weight. I hadn't, you know, my body hadn't changed. And somebody said, what's, what's different about you, Jennifer? You're standing up taller. Like you look taller. And it was, well, I mean, that was a physical benefit of the yoga practice, right? Because you're starting to work on your back, your, your posture, the muscles that help you hold up, right? But on an even deeper level, people will notice when you yes. start to pay attention, even with your meditation practice and all of these, the breath work practice. I think it's a beautiful. And you will bless them with your presence. Yeah. You'll be an energy giver. Because I think that's awesome. like, how can we quiet the mind and meditation if we're full of anger and discontentment, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Or, how or can try we, to like, hold on. Yeah. How can we experience stillness in the posture if we're not ready for the tapas to be present? You know, all these things add so much, not only to our physical practice, but to our lives when we can embody them. Yep. And those all around us. And it's this beautiful rippling effect. And, and we all have the opportunity to be the lotus flower in a world that's really mucky by practicing these ethical ideals. We can all, because we all are beautiful lotus flowers of some varying degree, but imagine cultivating that in the muck and the mire. And, and then like you have these flowers coming up in your own pond and imagine the the beautiful world that could become with all the the lotus flowers blooming absolutely and we have loved this journey with you we will be revisiting this these subjects at some point and Very we'll sweet. be coming up with more topics for sacred spaces Woohoo! we've got what is it there's six more limbs we can discuss yeah I thought about that because we could go into each one. And we, I love diving into the mythology. I know that, that that's another fun thing that I would, um, I plan on. I keep poking at you like, let's do more mythology. Yeah, more I, I'm just, it's just not as in my wheelhouse as you, as you, but when we did that one, I really enjoyed it. It was fun. It was I fun. just, you know, it's just not like, I haven't studied that part of it as much as you, but I'm totally willing to. So stay tuned. Make sure you subscribe to this channel, whether you're listening to it on any of the major podcast platforms or right here on YouTube. Thank you again for watching. My name is Jennifer Dixon with Thrive Yoga and Wellness.
and I'm Merritt Malik Plum with the Energy Center. Namaste. Hey. Yes, y'all go in peace.